um, frameworks. Last time I had a guest lecture from Ying Ching, who was uh, my lab mate. He was a developer of Cafe and TensorFlow and Cafe 2 at Facebook. Um, he gave the, a whole hour about frameworks. So there's a lot to cover. And I will not cover nearly as much. I just have really just a couple of slides. But I think I want to get the most important thing. So deep learning frameworks can roughly be thought of on two axes. How easy is it to develop in this framework? That's on the bottom uh, on the x-axis, good for development. And then once you develop a model, how easy or how scalable is it when you actually put it in production? And that's on the y-axis here. So one of the first deep learning frameworks was Theano and, uh, I'm not, and, and uh, Torch and stuff. And I'm not putting that on there. But I think after AlexNet kicked off the deep learning revolution in 2012, one of the first deep learning frameworks to really get enterprise adoption is CAFE, which was actually developed by my lab group um, here at Berkeley, like six floors up from this room. Um, and it's built in C++. To add a layer, you have to code it in C++ and code the, back, uh, the, the backward step. You code the forward step, which is usually pretty easy. But you also have to code the backward step yourself, which means you have to do some math and derive the, uh, the derivative of it. So it's not easy to develop. But because it is in C++ and because everything is so optimized, it is actually very good for production. And so even today, financial services and a bunch of real-time applications of deep learning are still using CAFE uh, because it's so good in production. TensorFlow came out a couple of years after CAFE. And it was a, CAFE was just developed by really just like four people, uh, grad students. TensorFlow was developed by something like 100 people and now over you know, several hundred people at Google. And it was a big push specifically to develop a system that is good for production and can be deployed to servers that are optimized for deep learning, servers that are just commodity PCs, even mobile phones. And so TensorFlow really tried to solve the, 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 the problem of like write once and then run everywhere scalably. Um, it is pretty decent at production. It is not a very good development experience because it introduces this abstraction of the computational graph. So when you write a TensorFlow model, you're not actually writing code that gets executed. You're writing code that gets compiled by TensorFlow into something that gets executed. And it's that conceptual step that makes it kind of hard to write that code. And it's hard to debug it, because you can't just put a breakpoint in your TensorFlow model. Um, it's not as easy as that, because the code path is actually not in the code you wrote. The code path is generated from the code you wrote by TensorFlow. Keras came out as a kind of nice wrapper on top of TensorFlow and Theano, and then later MXNet, which is another kind of cafe-like thing. Um, and it focused on a good user experience on the development front. So it really pushed forward the good for development boundary. And because it's backed by TensorFlow, it's still pretty good for production. Because whatever you write in TensorFlow just gets compiled to a TensorFlow, ten, sorry, whatever you write in Keras just gets compiled to a TensorFlow graph. And there's not potentially as many things that you can write in TensorFlow as you can in, ten, that you can write in Keras as you can in TensorFlow. But whatever you can write in Keras is going to be just as good as if you had written it on TensorFlow. And then most recently, we have PyTorch from Facebook. Um, Facebook had researchers that used to work on a deep learning framework called Torch, which is in a language called Lua, which no one knows how to use. Um, but it's apparently very nice. I don't want to, uh, you know, it's, I don't want to badmouth it. But <laughs> PyTorch was specifically the ideas of Torch, but in Python. And it's been phenomenally successful at being really good for development because you just write Python code, and that's the code that gets essentially executed. Um, so if you want to put a breakpoint right in the middle of your model, you can with PyTorch. Um, and that's very liberating. And it's really what a lot of researchers have shifted into because it is easy to make all kinds of like loops and crazy models and circular decision trees and stuff like that. Our recommendation is unless you have a good reason not to, and you can explain to someone else why you're not, you should use TensorFlow probably with the Keras front end or PyTorch. Um, and the reason I say either one is because they're actually both converging to the same, what I think, ideal point. 
And the ideal point is that it should be easy to develop it by just writing some code, running it, and then you know, keeping track of all the gradients, backpropping automatically through it, which is what PyTorch is famous for. But TensorFlow is also has the same functionality, or it will in TensorFlow 2.0, with this eager execution mode. And then on the other hand, PyTorch um, is really good at defining by run, but it hasn't been very optimized for different platforms. But they are resolving it, or potentially already have resolved it, by adding CAFE2, which is the successor to CAFE, which is also in C++, uh, directly into the PyTorch code base. So what happens now is you define your PyTorch model by just writing code. But then when you're ready to pr productionize it, you compile it into an optimized graph. Um, and that's executed using CAFE2. And because CAFE2 is just C++, it can run on anything. It can run on your phone or anywhere. Uh, anecdotally, like we've all met people who are happy that they switched to PyTorch. And I personally haven't met people who've switched away from PyTorch to something else. And we're happy about that. So take that for what it's worth. Um, Google searches. People are searching a lot for TensorFlow and Keras, definitely. And in our interviews with, so we did like 20, 25 interviews with deep learning practitioners in preparation for this. Uh, most people use TensorFlow and Keras, but PyTorch is definitely growing. These are job posts, though, and TensorFlow is definitely number one. But then, you know, CAFE is still up there, and that's because a lot of like kind of more boring industries, I guess, like oil and financial and medical stuff, <laughs> are using uh, CAFE still because it's so fast and because people kind of learned it and they're okay with C++. 